All right. So welcome back to Your Empowered Birth, where I am basically going to read to you each chapter of my book, Your Empowered Birth. Why am I doing this? Because I just want to get that information out there. I know how powerful empowered birth can be. And I also know what happens when you go down the typical route of getting the natural birth in the medical system, which then undermines your confidence in your body and can lead to interventions in your birth that you weren't expecting and get into the natural birth traps. Make sure you go back and watch some of my other videos on natural birth traps if you're not sure what I'm talking about. But basically, it comes down to this. The natural birth that you have been taught through our medical system and through society that you can achieve is not the full experience. In fact, it's like getting ice cream from a organic deli where you have actually seen the cows and you know where the milk is coming from and you know that it's all natural versus the store-bought stuff that you get out of the grocery store that says frozen dessert on the label. The medical system is basically selling you the frozen dessert version of natural birth and our birth culture keeps perpetuating this which means that you're not getting the full experience. You're not being able to tune into your body. Birth is more painful. It's more traumatic. More things go wrong. You end up coming away from it, basically feeling like something is missing. And I noticed this with my own birth with my son, where I did everything possible to get the full experience. And I still ended up getting the trauma version of it trying to fight, trying to beg, trying to compromise. So my book, Your Empowered Birth, is all about getting the birth you truly want, your true natural birth experience, without having to fight, beg, or compromise. Why do I focus on natural birth as the conduit for empowered birth? Because what I truly believe is that you are designed to birth your baby. And if you need medical intervention, then that is something you can call in. However, it needs to be your choice. It can't be the choice of the medical system and it can't be based on fear. So what I help my clients to do is I get them past their fear. I train up their partners. I help them to navigate the medical system, find the loopholes and advocate for themselves strongly and not crumble under the pressure so that they can actually experience the true natural birth or as close to it as they can get. And it's just a better experience for them overall, where they're like, you know what, if I had gone the typical route, I'd be traumatized right now. So if you haven't been following along for a while, then I'm just going to let you know that we are now on chapter five of your empowered birth. And you're going to want to go back and watch the other videos where I talk about the natural birth traps, why birth goes wrong. I shared my two empowered birth stories, the first one in the hospital with my son. Second one was when I reclaimed birth with my daughter. Now I'm going to share my five pillar system, my framework that allows you to get your birth any way you want. This framework is also like a safety net. So it can be really scary and daunting to do something that the whole world has basically told you you can't do. And it can be really confronting to say no to your care provider or to tell your partner, actually, we're going to have this baby at home. So by using this powerful system, what this does is it allows you to create that safety net so then you feel more confident going for what you really want and you can see that vision. So before I get started into this chapter, I just want to let you know that you can actually get your own copy of chapter five. If you go to my website, empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash chapter, it's the entire outline of chapter five telling you about the five pillar system and what you need to really focus on in getting that beautiful birth experience that you truly desire, the true natural birth experience, the empowered birth method. And in addition to that, you'll also get onto the email newsletter. You will receive more tips from me on how to have an empowered birth. And if you want to work with me further, there's ways to do that as well. You can just reach out to me at hello at empoweringmomsbirth.com. Either myself or one of my team members will help you and support you, see where you're at. And we can either recommend things that might help you or send you a free resource that might help you, 
Or maybe it's that you want to work further and you want to go deeper into the empowered birth method, in which case I do have my program, which is called Your Empowered Birth Workshop and Your Empowered Birth Academy. I'll tell you about that at the end after I'm finished reading through Your Empowered Birth and you get to watch all of those videos. But in the meantime, let me just say that if you go and get this chapter, it will change your life. It has changed the lives of so many of my clients. It has transformed my own life. If you had been listening at the beginning when I talked about my story of how I came to this and what I've really been through and how I've used this system in other aspects of my life, then you know that I went through a house fire. I went through a dissolution of my marriage. I went through like the most traumatic things that you could possibly think of to happen in the span of a year. And I rose up from the ashes using this method. So this isn't just for birth. I want to be clear with that. I've done this on other podcasts where I've talked about this system. But if you want the full thing, all you have to do is go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash chapter. All right, so let's get started. Chapter five, the five pillars of empowered birth. We have finally come to the chapter you've been waiting for. I mentioned at the start of this book that there are five determining factors that you need to consider when you're planning an empowered birth. I also told you that these things all work together to create a system that revolutionized birth planning for me and for my friends and clients. So what are these five pillars and how did I come to discover this powerful system? If you remember from my two birth stories, part of what led to my traumatic first birth was that I didn't have the right education and I had no idea who to hire as a care provider or even what I needed for support. I would thought I would birth at home, but I didn't know that there was going to be a fight on my hands to do so. It turns out that this is a common occurrence, especially for a first time mom. By the time of my second pregnancy, I was working within the community as a birth advocate. I had learned that there were certain red flags to watch out for when choosing a care provider, and I learned more about doulas, midwives, and the real struggles that they faced in supporting their clients within our current birthing culture. Basically, by becoming the fly on the wall, reading the tragic stories of other mothers, and listening to the horrors witnessed by the birth workers who were fighting for change, I started to see certain patterns emerging. I recognized that if I was going to get my do-over home birth and do it my way, then I needed to be more vigilant and play the game smarter than I had before. I also needed to draw on other areas of my previous education, specifically psychology, sociology, and the historical context of how certain attitudes and practices came to be in the first place. Basically, I had focused so much last time on what other people had to say about how birth had to go, that I forgot one key principle. Everyone is a human first and an expert second. As a new mom, I had forgotten this and gone blindly into the maternity care system, assuming that I would be taken care of and that my choices would be respected. After all, why wouldn't they be? It's a story that most of the moms who come to me have told, and it shows that our culture perpetuates the idea that we are not truly in charge of our own bodies. Women and birthing people are infantilized during pregnancy. We go from being seen as capable adults who can make our own decisions to suddenly feeling like we have to ask permission for everything we want to do or not do in our pregnancy. Things that we never thought about before suddenly plague us. We're told that our favorite deli meats are off the menu. We agonize over whether it would be okay to have sex or to have a hot bath or to exercise. That capable, powerful woman is slowly chipped away at, and you don't even realize it's happening, but it's built right into the culture of maternity care. From the moment you first find out you're pregnant, you're treated differently. You're given dirty looks if you decide to have the fries instead of the salad. And you're reminded constantly that you need to run your birth plans by your doctor to see what they suggest you do. Consider the language we use, which often puts us as passive participants in our own births. 
When you keep hearing the common rhetoric of am I allowed and they wouldn't let me, when it comes to birth, it's clear that what you've been led to believe and the reality of how you're treated in birth are entrenched in the patriarchy and the idea that you need saving from your own body. It's that notion that you just suck it up for your baby's sake, even though every part of your inner self may be screaming at you as if you're the unwitting victim of a slasher film. No, the subconscious cries, don't go in there. They're going to take away your power, drug you up and cut you without your consent. There are countless videos, social media posts and books written by doulas and midwives. There are whispers in the birth communities and doulas might even give warnings about exactly what awaits us if we go to that hospital, agree to that intervention or hire that doctor. But do we listen? Oftentimes we don't. This is why, despite the fact that I had deeply desired a home birth with my first baby, I ultimately had given into what others said was best for me. Mothers and birthing people are told to trust the process, go with the flow, and believe they can birth their babies without intervention, and then to go into a hospital where their chances of actually getting that physiological birth could be determined more easily by a flip of the coin. It's a sad state of affairs that in recently digging into the statistics of some of the local hospitals, I found a cesarean rate of 45 to 48%. And we wonder why our rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, postpartum depression, and birth trauma keep rising? Our culture perpetuates this further by telling us that all that matters is a healthy baby, and we need to lower our expectations. The result is that we are told, you can do it. And then in the same breath, they say, actually, you really shouldn't have pinned all your hopes on a natural birth because birth is unpredictable. When birth inevitably goes wrong, thanks to the very interventions they said would prevent that trauma you were trying to avoid. You're told to be grateful for the live baby, even if you might feel like dying inside. So how do you get out of this mess? I realized that not only were there five distinct pillars with which an empowered birth was more likely to happen, but that missing any one of these pillars could derail a birth that might otherwise have been ecstatic for the person experiencing it. These are the elements that I pulled into my own birth with my daughter. It's what I teach extensively inside my programs and workshops in varying degrees. I've tested this formula out both with my own births and life in general, and my clients have had varying degrees of success and satisfaction, even when their births didn't go according to plan. These five pillars are the very foundation of creating anything you desire, not just in birth, but in life, and particularly in parenting. It is also the key to tearing down the social constructs and mindsets that no longer serve you or your higher self, your empowered self. As we dive deeper into this chapter, take note of which areas you may be lacking or need to optimize to better suit your own desires for your birth experience. Consider any examples and stories that speak to you and take as many notes as you can or find some other way of recording your insights into the material. There may be things that come up for you that you hadn't realized before and you might start to question what you were taught through the mainstream media and education as well as what you learned from family and friends. It's more than likely that as you pay attention to your thoughts and feelings, you'll feel a shift happening where new possibilities and ideas may open up for you. That's your empowered self coming through, guiding you on the path that will best align to what you truly desire. You've been taught from an early age not to trust your intuition and instead go by what can be measured and verified by science. I'm inviting you to set aside that patriarchal way of thinking for a few hours and embrace that inner knowing we are all capable of. We can blend the masculine science with the feminine intuition later on, but for now, set aside all judgments and let's dive deep into these pillars. Pillar number one, the right mindset. When you hear the word mindset, what comes to mind for you? For myself, I grew up in a very masculine household where science and logic were the only things that made any sense 
And as a result, I used to roll my eyes outwardly whenever anyone would talk about how our thoughts shaped our reality. I spent the first half of my life actively trying to ignore that tiny voice inside me that was telling me there was more to life than what could be seen, and it wasn't until I was pregnant with my second child that I truly understood the power in positive thinking and intuition. If this is you right now, hear me out before you toss this book in the bin with the other self-help books. I'll confess that I didn't believe in affirmations or visualizations either. When my doula suggested them to me, I smiled, I nodded my head, and then I did what I had always done. I read more information on how to get the birth I wanted in the most scientific and logical way possible. I read the medical journals, dove deep into the birth books, and looked at the practical elements of birth stories. I'm sad to say that I missed a great deal when I focused only on the data and the evidence. Luckily, the universe tends to hand us the exact things we need in order to learn the lessons necessary to move forward. And a lot of things happened in my life during my pregnancy and afterward that started to shift my thinking around mindset. The most obvious one would have to be the weeks of stop and start labor that I endured partly because I was holding myself back from what I truly wanted that birth to be like. Whenever I pictured it, I was alone and birthing in my own power. But the actions I was taking in terms of going along with certain things for the comfort of the midwife and the other people in my family weren't congruent with what I wanted. For example, I had it in my head that the midwife would have to be at the house for my entire labor, whether she was needed or not. This was in direct conflict with my desire to be left alone. So what would happen was that every time I had the niggling sensations of labor starting up, I would text my doula and tell my partner. We would go through the whole process of setting up support for our son. I would get started on my labor exercises and we would spend the time waiting for something to happen. I would have consistent surges, but they would be several minutes apart and then taper off at some point. The next time it would happen, the surges would be stronger and closer together. Then they would again taper off. I endured this from 37 weeks to just after my guest date, and it really messed with my head. In hindsight, knowing what I know now and having helped other women through this frustration, I realized I had been holding on to a lot of fear and a desire to control other people's responses to my birth. I was warring with the desire to birth my baby while maintaining my own autonomy in all things, and ultimately what ended up happening was that when I called people into my space, my labor would slow and then stop because I didn't actually want people in my space. With my first pregnancy, I also struggled with a lot of limiting beliefs about what I was allowed to do. And while understanding informed consent is helpful to dispel most of those limitations, it's the cultural expectations and human need for acceptance that ultimately keeps us stuck in choosing things that we actually don't want to do. For example, when I was told I had to birth in the hospital, I didn't know that I could say no. I hadn't fully understood my rights to informed consent and refusal. But more importantly than knowing my rights, I didn't have the understanding yet that I was internalizing the expectations of my family members and seeking the approval of the midwives at the same time. In essence, my own limiting belief that I didn't have enough education to make decisions for myself, combined with my fear of not being liked, ultimately led to me turning down the option to plan a home birth at 39 weeks when my midwife told me that they had made a mistake. Our beliefs about ourselves and our capabilities are often the biggest obstacle we need to overcome. If you understand that you have the human right to say no, but you're battling with the belief that you have a societal obligation to your family to just do as you're told, then it doesn't matter if you don't want to do something and are told that you can say no. In the end, your belief that other people know more than you do about what you need can sabotage your efforts. This almost happened again with the birth of my second child because even though I spent the entire pregnancy telling myself and other people that I would not be talked out of what I wanted, 
In the end, I agreed to a vaginal exam I hadn't actually wanted to have out of a feeling of pressure and wanting to not be perceived as difficult by my midwife. When I recognized that I was still people pleasing, I took action to clear out my headspace and my physical space and birth on my own. I knew that the best thing for me to maintain my boundaries on what I wanted was to send away both the doula and the midwife and even my children's father and labor completely by myself. You don't have to go to that extreme unless you want to, but knowing your own mind and where you have limiting beliefs or struggle to set boundaries will help you identify areas you may need to work on or steps you might want to take to protect your mindset during labor, which in turn will help you in your quest to gain more knowledge and filter out anything that isn't aligned with what you truly want for your birth. Pillar number two, the right education. How much do you really know about birth physiology and what your body needs to birth safely and effectively? If you've only ever heard that birth is painful, only seen hospital births, only heard stories of hospital births, and no one in your family or friend circle has ever had a home birth, then chances are that you don't actually know what to expect in birth. Don't feel bad about this because most doctors and nurses have also never seen a physiological birth. In fact, very few are trained to sit on their hands and simply observe a mother pushing out her own baby in whatever position feels comfortable without anyone touching her. In contrast, midwives and doulas who attend home births see this more often, though it all depends on how hands-off they happen to be. Physiological birth is rare in our culture. You don't really see it in mainstream media. And often, if there is an unassisted birth depicted, it's implied that this is an emergency where we need to be fearful for the safety of the baby and the mother. In reality, there are plenty of people choosing unassisted birth, and others can have one unintentionally. How many times do you hear stories of babies who were born in cars en route to the hospital? Or the mother who didn't know she was in labor and accidentally birthed on the toilet? These tales of fast births are often seen as miracles because even though there was no doctor present, somehow the mother and baby were okay. Our mainstream birth culture has done a phenomenal job of getting us to mistrust our own bodies and our physiological processes. We're convinced that birth doesn't work more times than it does work. The cesarean rates and intervention rates continue to rise each year. And the lie that is told over and over again is that birth is dangerous and our bodies are ill-equipped to birth without medical assistance. If that were true, we wouldn't have so many humans on this planet. It has only been in the last few hundred years that men took over the knowledge and wisdom of childbirth and created modern obstetrics. And when you dive into the her story of maternity care, it becomes glaringly obvious that what we've been taught all this time has fed into the narrative that we need doctors to tell us when it's time to push our own babies out, because if it wouldn't happen without them. And yet, it does happen without them. Babies are born at home, in cars, on planes, in bathrooms, and even in parking lots. Instagram and YouTube are full of fast birth videos that prove how quickly and easily babies can come out without anyone putting any fingers into a vagina. Unfortunately, if you don't know where to look for the education surrounding true birth physiology, you may be stuck in certain narratives of what is safe. Go into any parent form and ask about due dates, for example, and sooner or later someone will try to tell you that going past 40 weeks is too dangerous. I've heard people talk about the placenta failing, as if there's an expiration date on its ability to function, even in spite of the fact that many 42-week mothers I know have had very healthy babies and very healthy placentas. Another myth is that dilation will determine when you'll go into labor or when you'll have your baby. I can tell you from experience that dilation means absolutely nothing at all and fingers poking around in there can cause your cervix to close right back up and labor to stop altogether until you feel safe again. 
Having the right education means understanding the way your body actually works and dispelling the common myths and misconceptions that often lead to you agreeing to interventions, tests, and exams that you don't actually want and may even be unnecessary. Inside my programs and workshops, I stress a lot on getting the right education. I've brought in multiple guest speakers on any number of topics pertaining to birth, pregnancy, postpartum, breastfeeding, and all aspects of parenting because giving my clients and members of my community the most evidence-based education is what I know will help them make informed decisions. The right education consists of understanding birth physiology, understanding your human rights within the system, and the politics of the system itself so that you are better prepared to navigate the common traps that pop up and catch so many moms and birthing people by surprise. I will go into deeper detail about this as well as how to determine whether the information you are receiving is from a reliable source and how to break it all down and make decisions later in this book. You might also want to go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras and grab a special bonus that will teach you about physiological birth and what to actually expect. Pillar number three, the right environment. Remember how earlier I said that you need to birth where you feel safest? The right environment is about understanding where you are likely to feel the safest, given the kind of birth you want to have. When you know what elements are within a certain birth location and how they are likely to enhance or hinder your birth desires, you'll have a better idea of where that birth needs to take place. It's no secret that I am partially biased toward home birth as the safest choice for most low-risk moms planning a physiological birth. My reasons for this are based on my own experiences, the education I've received over the years, and the experiences of my clients and other mothers in my community. The hospital is where 99% of people give birth, though I would argue it's not the safest place for birth to happen. That being said, if you are more inclined to birth in a hospital, a physiological birth, even an unassisted VBAC, as Jenny has proven, is still possible provided you know how to advocate for yourself. You will recall from earlier in this book that I did manage to do it with my first child, and I later learned that my midwife had been willing to get in trouble for me to have that physiological birth because she was close to retirement and didn't care who she pissed off. This was, of course, pure luck. And today, if presented with the same option to go back to that hospital, I would choose anywhere else because of the high intervention rates and lack of informed consent. The reality is that one of the biggest determinants as to whether you will have a physiological birth or a preventable cesarean depends on which hospital you walk into. This is because the OB culture that runs that hospital, combined with the restrictions and guidelines written up by the insurance companies who want zero risk, can all lead to birth being treated like a disaster waiting to happen, rather than a normal biological process. This is why bigger hospitals may have higher rates of induction, cesarean, IV use, continuous fetal monitoring, and less patients in the pushing stage. It's not failure to progress. That is the problem. Our bodies are not defective. The system is. The system itself was built on the premise that birth needs to be controlled and made to be more efficient. When you're inside that system, then you're going to have a harder time fighting to not be put through the conveyor belt. This is not to say that all hospitals follow this model of care. There are some facilities where the staff have made real efforts to reduce the rate of induction and cesarean with varying degrees of success. There's one hospital in particular with a 100% VBAC success rate and others facilitate vaginal breech birth. So if the hospital you've chosen tells you that VBAC or breech birth is not safe and not allowed, then that hospital is also likely to have other policies in place that inhibit a true physiological birth. You'll learn more about what you can do to ensure a right environment later. There is also a special bonus report that will walk you through the different types of options for your birth environment. You can go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras to grab it along with the other bonus material from this book. 
pillar number four, the right facilitators. Imagine for a moment you wanted to run a marathon. What would be the best way to accomplish your goal? Well, more than likely, you might want to hire a coach, right? So picture yourself going to this coach who tells you that marathons are really hard to run. He'll, of course, support you if you really want to do it. But he also tells you that most people fail at running a marathon, that it's really not all it's cracked up to be, and that physically it's not possible to run a marathon without a lot of damage to your body afterward. How likely would you keep paying that coach to help you? You would probably ask them why the hell they're coaching people in the first place if they believe all that nonsense. Unfortunately, when it comes to birth, often that's what happens when you aren't aware of just who you're hiring as your care provider. This is especially true when you're planning a natural birth, choosing a vaginal birth after cesarean, or you would like a breech birth. Home birth is another hot button issue. And the running dialogue of an unsupportive care provider is that birth is only ever safe when it's managed in the hospital. The good news is that not all OBs will push a cesarean or induction, but the bad news is that some midwives do. Often clients come to me who thought they had a supportive care provider only to later discover that they had been slowly chipping away at their defenses and confidence until these poor moms were talked into the epidural, induction, or cesarean that they didn't want to have. Remember when I told you about the mistakes I made with my first pregnancy? Well, one of them was thinking I would be safe from that kind of trickery if I had a midwife. It turned out that I was not, and that's why it's not enough to choose a midwife over an obstetrician. You have to know who you're hiring and spot any red flags early on. I already told you that one of the biggest determining factors in whether you have a cesarean is where you give birth, but the second one is who you hire to support you. The wrong care provider can really derail your birth, especially if they are determined to push their own agenda, even after you politely decline their recommendations. Taken to the extreme, that type of care provider may even use threats, coercive tactics, fear, intimidation, and even commit acts of physical force against you. Take, for example, the case of Kimberly Turban, who declined an episiotomy and had her vagina cut 12 times with scissors by the doctor. Her case settled out of court, but the reason she received any justice at all was because the incident was caught on tape. Caroline Malatesta is another example. She has permanent nerve damage due to nurses holding her baby in to keep her from birthing before the doctor arrived. My own clients with previous birth traumas have also recounted stories of past abuse by their care providers, including one OB intentionally punishing a friend of mine for choosing a different induction method than what he had wanted her to choose. He left her waiting for hours and then later chose not to get her additional pain medication after her emergency cesarean. In contrast, the right care provider is the one who isn't afraid to go against the system and advocate for you to have the birth you want. I was fortunate that Jules had been on call the day I went into labor. Had any other midwife been attending at the hospital, I might have had a cesarean. It was Jules who ultimately broke protocol for me to continue pushing even after the two-hour cutoff, and she even kept the OBs waiting outside, albeit rather impatiently. After the birth, she also let me know that what I had experienced in the hospital wasn't how birth could be at home, and that if I truly wanted a hands-off birth, that I needed to hire a different midwife practice. It was a small thing, but it meant everything to me that she told me the truth about the system. I was able to avoid a second traumatic birth because of the information she had passed on to me. I'll be sharing that wisdom with you further inside this book. You can also access a special list of questions to ask yourself to figure out if your care provider is the right fit for you by going to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras.
In addition to the right care provider, you may also choose to hire other people to help facilitate your learning and provide extra guidance and support. I have already mentioned how important it is to hire a doula and take a childbirth class. But much like you can't always trust your care provider to have your best interests, your childbirth educator and your doula are not without their biases and limitations either. I mentioned earlier in this book that I had taken two different childbirth classes and both taught birth a completely different way. If you choose whichever classes are popular, local, cheapest, or the ones that your care provider or hospital suggest, you are setting yourself up to fail before you even begin. I know that a lot of mainstream advice out there might even tell you that you need to take the hospital classes so that you can learn what to expect there, but here's the problem. Those classes are not designed to teach you how to give birth. Remember, your body is already going to do it. Instead, what you will learn is the skewed medical perspective of birth and how to be a good, compliant little patient who does what you're told. This is why out of 20 students, I was the only one who actually had a physiological birth. Everyone else had only relied on the education provided by the nurse, and the nurse was teaching only what the health authority wanted her to teach. There was no discussion of risks when it came to induction or the epidural. There was no real discussion of how to advocate and decline unwanted interventions. Everyone believed that vaginal exams were required during labor. No one was taught to question anything. Those classes were designed a certain way, and the system doesn't like it when you go learn outside of what they want you to know. This is exactly why you need to do it anyway. You need to be intentional when you're choosing a childbirth class. You can't just go with whatever is popular or what your friend recommends. Instead, you need to figure out exactly what kind of birth you want to have, then seek out a class that teaches that. Today, there are many options that will accommodate any learning style. Doulas often teach private group classes and even individual sessions if you would rather learn without an audience. There are online options, both recorded videos and even live interaction over Zoom. If you can't find a local class, then these online options can save you from making grievous mistakes as you navigate your maternity care system. Finally, you need to consider who you're hiring as your doula. One of the biggest mistakes I made was focusing on the cost and reacting out of emotion and desperation. You do not want to make the same mistakes. Doulas all have different price points they work at, and they also have different levels of experience. Some have more generous packages than others. Some have special skills that can enhance your birth and postpartum experience. There are doulas who work on sliding scales and those who will take payment plans. What you want to focus on before you hire a doula is what your needs are, how you want to be supported, and what else you might wish to have support with during and after your birth. For a list of questions to consider when hiring a doula, as well as a free mini report, make sure you grab your book bonuses off my website at empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras. Pillar number five, the right support. I want you to imagine that you're telling your friends and family about your desires for your ideal birth. You've worked through most of your fears and limiting beliefs. You have the education behind you. You've chosen a home birth and you have chosen a care provider that aligns with what you want. You're all excited and pumped up for this birth. As you're telling your family and friends this amazing plan you've come up with, you can see their lips press into a thin line. They're looking at you with a mix of fear and concern. They might even frown or roll their eyes at what you want. Some might tell you there's no trophy for a natural birth. Others might have had the exact opposite of what you want and tell you, don't get your hopes up. Some of those friends and family members might even be offended that you don't want the same kind of birth they had. If you have a particularly high-strung mother, she might even insist that you abandon your plans for birth and choose something safer. Your aunt might try to talk some sense into you. 
A particularly meddlesome in-law might ask your spouse, are you really going to let this happen? You start to feel cornered and with none of your friends or family members able to understand, you may turn to the online mom groups. There you try to find some common ground and ask questions about what tests or procedures you could safely refuse, or you outright ask if anyone else is having the kind of birth you want. But if you're not in the right community, then you can probably guess what's going to happen. You get bombarded with comments about how you're being selfish, or they say, I would never put my baby at risk like that. Misinformation abounds because most of the moms are going by what their care providers have told them. And the more mainstream the group, the more likely their care providers are giving heavily biased opinions that will ultimately lead to more interventions and birth trauma. Put another way, if your care provider is your coach, then your support team is your cheering squad. You don't want to run a marathon where all your supporters are telling you that what you are trying to do is too hard and that you should just give up before you even start. One way to guard against the negative voices and get some real support is to hire a doula. Another way you can protect your headspace is to find other people who are planning or have already had the kind of birth you want. This is part of what makes my programs and my community so powerful. I found that the collective stories shared in these spaces and the wisdom that often gets passed on after someone has had an empowered birth can do far more to inspire others than simply spouting off facts and figures from a textbook. The more stories are shared, the more you can see what is actually possible in birth beyond what the medical community would like you to believe. There's also something really beautiful about having a group of people who all believe in your ability to birth and to stand in your own power and have them all cheer you on. If you haven't experienced that and would like to, I would encourage you to check out the resources at the back of this book. Putting it all together. As you can see, each pillar is powerful on its own, but the real magic happens when you put all five together and optimize them. A house is only as strong as its walls holding everything up. And if any one of the pillars is weak and crumbling, then any floors you try to build on top of them will not hold up for very long. This book was designed for you to go through each of the five pillars in a certain order. So please don't skip ahead, no matter how tempted you are to find out what's next. There are also several exercises for you to do and prompts for journaling, and I encourage you strongly to do that homework. I have found that when we write things down, we commit more fully to learning them, and many of the exercises I give you ultimately have the purpose of bringing you more fully into your power as the decision maker in your care. Finally, I have a few extra goodies for you that you can download. Simply go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras and download them. You might also like to check out some of my other programs and video courses designed to go deeper into several topics that my past clients have struggled with, where I was able to get them back on track to their empowered births. Once you understand these five pillars, how they work and how to optimize each one, then you will be ready to create your own unique birth vision and plan out your own empowered birth. I will outline how to do that effectively in the final two sections. However, there is so much more that you can gain by going through one of my empowered birth workshops or through my more extensive programs and courses. I will also mention that these two sections are deliberately split up, much like my two births at the beginning of this book. That is because I want this to serve you whether this is your first pregnancy or you've already had the system fail you and you're determined to reclaim your power. As you can imagine, planning an empowered birth the first time is very different from planning one after you've already experienced a birth that didn't go to plan, where maybe you felt that you had failed or your body didn't work or you just can't see any other possibility other than for something to go wrong again. If this is your first baby, then you will want to pay close attention to the next chapter, but you may also find a lot of encouragement and insight from the stories I'll share later in the second section.
Many of these moms made a lot of the typical mistakes of first-time moms, and it will also help you to see that even if something does go wrong, there is healing and you can reclaim your power the next time. You don't have to repeat the past. If you have already had one or several pregnancies, then the first chapter will help you find insight into what might have led to your traumatic experience in the first place. So you can see it with new eyes and a new perspective. It may bring healing and clarity, so please don't skip it. If you start to feel triggered, what you can do is take a break and come back after you've had time to process your feelings and are in a more empowered state of mind. I will also tell you that this is not all there is to know about planning an empowered birth. This is why I encourage you to check out some of the resources at the back of this book so that you can go deeper with what you're going to learn. Because once you understand how to plan your birth with power and get out of your fear, you'll start to see that information in a new way. Consider this book a crash course in my signature system and what it can truly do for you. I encourage you to keep a journal as you read through each chapter and section and to write down any thoughts that come to mind. You will find out why in just a moment when we dive into planning your empowered birth. It will also help you stay focused and you may have some ideas of what kind of birth you would like to have based on some of the stories I will share of past clients, friends, and even fellow doulas in my community. The one thing I want you to take away from these stories is that all kinds of empowered births are possible, even those that don't go according to plan. If you keep this in mind while reading, you will see a world of possibilities and options open up that you may not have been aware of before. So if you're ready, it's time to start challenging what you think you know about birth and take your power back. So this is the overview of the empowered birth system. The next two chapters in this book I'm going to go into a deeper dive in the areas of planning the birth you want the first time and planning the birth you want the next time. And then we finish up with the final thoughts. And I will give you an invitation at the end if you do want to go deeper with me on this. Because as I said, there is so much more to learn than just the overview of the five pillars. You need to get past your fear. You obviously need to have the right support. You need to be able to strongly advocate for yourself and you need to have that right education. And I couldn't fit that all inside of your empowered birth. However, I did include extra resources. You just go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras, go and download them. And if you love this book so far and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I want to keep it forever. You can go and get it off of Amazon. Just uh, type in your empowered birth and my name, Carly Bondarud. You can see behind me the spelling for it, and that will help you to get the birth you want. It's also going to help further the empowered birth movement, what we're really trying to create here. Some of the proceeds are also going to go to the birthhousenetwork.com, which is a website that is also a directory in creating Airbnb style birth houses and birthing suites. So basically, instead of having to go with a birth center, or if you're too far away from a hospital and home birth doesn't seem feasible for you, but you really don't want to be in the hospital, this is one of the ways that you can get around that. So as I said, it's a directory. So if as a birth worker or as a mom who happens to rent out a space, if you have a space that you want to put on this directory, you just go and reach out to the birthhousenetwork.com. Jenny takes care of that side of things. But basically what we're doing with the empowered birth method is we believe that you deserve to have an empowered birth. You deserve to have the true natural birth experience. And that is true even if you are labeled high risk by the medical system, which let's be honest, even if you happen to be 25 years old, you can get labeled high risk just by the fact that you've never had a baby before. If you're 35, oh my gosh, just the fact that you turned 35, suddenly you're high risk. And if you're 40, oh, heaven help you. You might as well just have that C-section now, right? But the truth is, is that Jenny was 41 years old. She had chronic high blood pressure, gestational diabetes. She'd had a previous C-section, previous preeclampsia and postpartum. And she ended up using the empowered birth system that I'm teaching you inside 
your empowered birth and inside my programs to basically get that beautiful empowered birth experience. She had a 15% chance of success of VBAC and she did it unassisted vaginal birth in a hospital where that's just not, that it's not heard of. Like they just don't do that in our health authority. We have the highest C-section rate in all of our province. And to be able to do that using the empowered birth method, it was just powerful for her. So again, if you want any of that, you can go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras, get your bonuses, go get your chapter, go get your empowered birth. And I will see you in the next section. And if you're loving these videos, if you're finding these really helpful, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Let's get this method out there. Let's get this movement going. Let's get this out into the hands of more moms. Because as I said, I created the system that wasn't available for me and wasn't available for my friends. And every mom that I've shared this with has been like, why did nobody tell me this? Well, the truth is that they, they don't know. Fish can't see the water they swim in. So please, please share this, pay it forward. I'm giving you this information because I truly want you to have that beautiful natural birth. I want you to have an empowered birth. I hate birth trauma. Birth trauma sucks. You don't deserve it. You deserve so much better than that. So as I said, just pay this forward. Send these out to your friends. Send this out to family. Anyone who's planning to get pregnant within the next year or so, make sure that they have this because this is really it. This is how you get that beautiful empowered birth. You can't just rely on typical birth education and you can't just rely on the medical system because we're ingrained in a culture of fear and we have mistrusted our bodies and we're not tapping into our intuition. So the final chapters of this book go into that system. And I'm going to give you the questions to ask as well. However, if you want the full thing, you just have to go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash extras and the list of questions will be there for you. So don't worry about having to try to take notes on all the questions. All right. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next week.